<laughs> I was afraid of this. I was afraid I'd get too nervous to do anything. I want to welcome you to Pentecost and say that this morning, uh, I want to just compliment this conference for having a sweet Holy Spirit here. It has been absolutely marvelous and the boating and our worship and so forth. It's good to be here. So I want to talk to you about how the Holy Spirit can capture us and make us different. So when we leave here, we're not the same. And I want to share how I have been encouraged by the witness of others. Because we're talking about encouragement. And Jessica had started the conference early on and talked about some of the discouraging news. We always have discouraging news in our families, in our own lives, and in our church but we need to be encouragement. So I want to show you how I've been encouraged after I talk about some difficult things. You know, the early church had to learn how to improvise, and I think Jesus is calling us up to improvise. Paul said of the church at Thessalonica, he said, you became imitators of us and of the Lord when you accepted the message that came from the Holy Spirit with joy in spite, in spite of great suffering. As a result, you became an example to all the believers in Macedonia and Acacia. It's in the middle of great suffering that the church learned to improvise and became an example to others. Now, to improvise means to compose, play, recite, or sing on the spur of the moment. That's what's making me nervous. <laughs> and the other thing that's making me nervous is that this is not working right. Hold on now. See, this is part of the script. You don't know this. this is, <laughs> you, you think I did this on purpose. It's, uh, I'm improvising. See, part of improvising is not being too self-conscious. To improvise also means to make, provide, or arrange from whatever materials are available. <laughs> so you have to use these crazy technological things. Let me see if I can demonstrate what I'm talking about improvising. I want Rick Thulis, my guitar teacher, to come out for a minute. He's also the pastor at Bunker Hill. He's going to help me try to improvise. Now, I'm a little nervous on this, but just bear with us. So, uh, Rich, can you help me here? I say he's my guitar teacher. Anything I do is his responsibility. <laughs> <laughs> he, he's basically at fault for everything that happens here if it doesn't go right. So he, he's going to play some chords, and I'm going to try to improvise a little bit with the chords. Those of you who know music know that I'm skating on thin air here. Okay. We're here all week. Just, just stay <laughs> wow, I'm glad that's over. Let me tell you, when I'm improvising, I am out of my comfort zone. I mean, I'm fairly new at this. I could get lost worse. I could be embarrassed. In fact, I am a little embarrassed. <laughs> when I'm improvising, I make mistakes. There's no score. There's no notes written down or script to follow. And I, I know I need to practice. I've got skills and tempo. I've got to look at the technique. I must listen and work with others around me. i got to be able to respond to what they do. Sometimes I lead, sometimes I follow, sometimes I just don't play anything. But when I improvise, I experience unbelievable joy. The, the music is like, I can't tell you what it's like when you're improvising out there and you find the note 
it's so satisfying. It's, it's like grace. It's like, it's like I'm creating something that doesn't belong to me. It, it's really a gift from God. Does anybody else have that experience with music? It's something like that right brain takes you sore. Now, it's hard to improvise unless you have someone encourage you, encouraging you. And for the past seven or so years, Rich has been patient with me, helping me learn at my own pace, ignoring most of my mistakes. And, and this is important, encouraging me most by his own love of the guitar and seeing me try to get a little better. Now, our first piece was something we improvised that was kind of pretty. It was kind of harmonic. Now I want to improvise some, uh, something that's got a little jazzy blues sound to it. And it's going to have a little dissonance to it. And uh, keep praying for me. Go ahead, Rich. See what tell we can them, do here. Tell them they can go. No, they don't have to do it. No, oh. they, they don't have to. <laughs> Well, you get the idea. I thought there was more song. Oh, I'm done. Now, whew, I'm glad that's over. Did you recognize the style of music? It's a blues style, kind of a jazzy blues. The blues were, were created by African Americans in the South, and they often express sadness at one level and yet hope at another level. It's kind of a song of lamentation, usually characterized by 12 bars and the occurrence of blue notes. Can you identify with that? Notes that distort the harmony. Blues is a form that's found in jazz, rhythm and blues, and rock and roll, and often with a call and response. When you get better at this, I'm hoping to, one person will do one thing and the other one kind of responds. I think it's like a metaphor for life. The blues, like most stories, begins at home. Things are comfortable. And, and then it has some dissonance, disturbance, then tries to resolve that dissonance, sometimes over and over and over, kind of like life. And then finally, by the grace of God, by the grace of God, that dissonance comes home again. And it feels so good when you're playing it and when it happens in your life. I think improvising is a life skill to make do with what you have especially for anyone in a struggling situation like Native Americans that were forced from their lands and they're still having problems. African Americans forced into slavery and are still discriminated against. Immigrants, past and present, including many of our foremothers and fathers, and Christians in all parts of the world today that are being persecuted, killed, and made into refugees away from their lands. Friends, people of faith have always seen disturbances as opportunities for God to appear and faith to come as we long for home. This morning I want to address three areas of dissonance that are disruptive to all of us where we need to find some resolution. And they are what I would call the dissonance of disparity, the dissonance of diversity, and the dissonance of discipleship. These are areas where there is tension between the teaching of Scripture and how we encourage one another, how we engage the world. I also want to share how I found encouragement in the midst of these tensions. And the first tension is the dissonance of disparity between the love of our neighbor and the resources of our neighbors. 
The great commandment is very clear. You know it. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. And, and, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. How can we love our neighbor as ourselves and not see the disparities of economics, education, health care, and other resources that are all around us? Ohio still has a challenge with the disparities in economics, employment, and school systems. Almost 1.8 million people in Ohio are poor. That is 16% of all persons whom poverty status has been determined. Children ages 0 to 11 and young adults from 18 to 24 had poverty rates in Ohio exceeding 20%. And do not forget, Ohio still has not addressed the disparity in funding our school systems throughout the state. I could quote more statistics about how we live in disparities. When we join mission teams, we see even more severe disparities up close, whether it's in Haiti, Cambodia, West Africa, or Zimbabwe. And part of the tension we feel, guess what this is, is that we often give money or seek to help others without developing deep personal relationships. And when we do that, we often unintentionally create dependencies that instead of helping to build people up, we actually cut them in terms of their self-reliance. How do we resolve this disparity? Well, I think we need to improvise. We need to sustain relationships and develop the assets of people we work with. I've been encouraged by Kenton Lee. 2007, Kenton was living and working in Nairobi, Kenya. He noticed that some people had shoes with the end of them cut out because their shoes were too small. Kenton asked himself, wouldn't it be great if there was a shoe that could adjust and expand so that kids at least always had a pair of shoes that fit? And in a spirit-filled moment, the shoe that grows was born. Look at this. This shoe grows five sizes and lasts five years, providing better protection and better help for children. It is made of leather, compressed rubber with snaps on it. There are no parts to break. And get this. The shoes are easily compressed and can be transported. 50 pairs will fit in a regular suitcase. And get this, 50 pairs in a suitcase weighs less than 50 pounds, the airline limit. And they sell for $30 a pair. But if you buy them in larger quantities, you can get them as low as $12. Ken Lee started Because International in 2009, and he says... They listen to those living in extreme poverty to hear their thoughts, ideas, and dreams for a better life. Then they work together to make those ideas into reality. You see, improvisation often leads to innovation and responding to real time needs that we don't have time for, but people enter our lives and we respond to them often leads to creative ideas for ministry. Now, unfortunately, it is often easier to find a technical solution to alleviate human need than it is to deal with relationships that need healing. I just wish that we could invent something to help people be reconciled in their differences and unified in working for the common good. Wouldn't it be great if we could put reconciliation, peace, and justice in a suitcase and deliver it to whoever needed it? I would deliver it first to Congress. Then I would take it to general conference. <laughs> the second tension is the dissonance of diversity between the kingdom of God and our various cultural, economic, generational, sexual, and political identities. I could talk a long time with this. I'm pretty tight script. God created diversity. Remember the Tower of Babel that's found in Genesis 11 when people all of one language wanted to build a tower to heaven and express their greatness. God confused their language and scattered them all over the faith of the earth. God made diversity. God also brought unity out of diversity on the day of Pentecost when people from every nation of the world with many different languages were all together in one place. And all of the Galileans were filled with the Holy Spirit. And they began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them ability. And everyone from all the countries of the world could hear 
these Galileans speaking about God's deeds of power in their own language. The church was born and continues in diversity, and the church is united in mission. But note, it's the Holy Spirit that brings unity out of the diversity. Maybe we need another of act of God through the Holy Spirit today to resolve the deep divisions within our society and within our church. On May the 23rd, Greg Palmer and I issued a call to prayer following the acquittal verdict of Cleveland police officer Michael Brelo and the deaths of Timothy Russell and Melissa Williams that occurred in 2012. And we acknowledge the need for healing, hope, and transformation in our communities. I just want to take a moment to applaud the civic and faith leaders of the Cleveland area that encouraged protests that were nonviolent. Friends, change is coming, and we need to support protest and nonviolence. Let's express our appreciation to the North Coast and the people around this state that worked hard. Encourage protest and encourage nonviolence. Remember that improvisation includes more than just new ways of doing things. It requires that we listen and learn from the places of tension. Sometimes we rush to resolve the dissonance by moving to familiar chords and progressions. But when we do that, creativity and innovation is lost. And we begin to repeat known and safe patterns. It is also good to remember that if we only live in the tensions and only, only nurture the blue notes forever, we'll never get home. We'll never get home. But just knowing that we can get back to home, even if dissonance comes, helps us have hope. And that's what Christ does for us. Of course, we have more than racial tensions in our world. We have tensions around economic disparity, sexual orientation, generational attitudes, and politics. And in spite of the connectivity of the Internet and an increase in global relationships, there's a parallel trend of people wanting to stay with people who think and look like them. It seems that some affinity groups and maybe some local churches in our United Methodist Church would also choose to be around people who all think alike rather than embrace the diversity of our larger church. Our tradition has always resisted people wanting church our own way. Hear me, we have always resisted a group of Christians saying we want church our way. Friends, that's why we have a clergy that is sent rather than called. We're a missionary movement. That is why we are not a national church like the Baptists, Lutherans, Presbyterians, Episcopalians, and United Church of Christ. We're a worldwide church. When we get together, we've got to, we've got to listen and respond to concerns beyond our own borders. And that's also why we're radically inclusive. Our ecclesiology or understanding of the church is that it's for sinners of all kinds, you and me, who seek to know the saving grace of God. We have never, ever believed as a church that the church is only for the good people or the saved people. Those of us in the church are only in the church because we've been graced by that saving grace, and our job is to let people outside who that grace also stands for to know that they've been saved because they don't know it. Now, in spite of the tensions around diversity, in recent months, I've got to tell you, I have been encouraged by what I'm seeing God doing, not by what I'm seeing the church or Congress doing. But frankly, and I'm not just saying this, I've been encouraged because I believe that something new, like a new Pentecost, is coming. Where people are going to be united in their differences. Because among young people that I meet today, there is a shift in the appreciation of diversity that will challenge the categories of culture as we know it. Want to see something beautiful? Take a look at this. This, my friends, is the racial dot map, a snapshot of diversity created by Dustin Cable at the University of Virginia in 2013. There is one dot per person in the United States on that map. 308,745,538 dots, one for every person in the 2010 census. And it's color-coded for each racial ethnic group with dots smaller than the pixels on your computer. 
For example, here is the racial dot map of Cleveland. You can zoom in if you go online. At a neighborhood level, you can even go in deeper. You can see inside Cleveland there. I do believe that God is doing a new thing among us. And the pioneers in this improvisation are those congregations seeking to be truly diverse across cultural, economic, gender, and political divisions that divide us. That is why they are finding unity, not by choosing to be with others like themselves, but they're finding unity by appreciating each person's unique story and faith journey. And I applaud those congregations that are becoming more diverse and truly inclusive for they are modeling what I think is the very kingdom of God. They are becoming more and more like the community in Acts. In essence, friends, I think as the church learns to embrace diversity, we will find at the local level, we will find more unity in our country and in our church. And we can be a witness far beyond what we think we can be today. So I celebrate. Go ahead, go ahead. So I celebrate those churches, large and small. Diversity has nothing to do with how many people are around you. There's always somebody a lot different than the people in the church, outside the church, usually within about a half a mile. I celebrate those churches that are working with the poor, developing different worship styles, those beginning intergenerational ministries. I commend those congregations that are hosting conversations on race, sexual orientation, and politics. For the goal is not to debate who is right on every issue, but to bring respect for our differences before the Lordship of Jesus Christ. I believe God is helping us learn that unity and diversity go together. If you want unity, you better seek out diversity. And if you want diversity and not want unity, then what are you up to? What's your real motivation? Friends, the church has to be a champion of diversity and a leader of unity today for our church and for our country. The third area that needs resolution is the dissonance of discipleship between Jesus calling us to share the good news and the stark decline in new disciples. Again, the Great Commission is clear. You know it. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. However, we have some serious, serious dissonance in discipleship. You have heard several references to the May release from the Pew Research Center on America's changing religious landscape. The subtitle says, Christians decline sharply as share of population, unaffiliated and other faiths continue to grow. Let me quote from this study since it's been referred to. While the drop in Christian affiliation is particularly pronounced among young adults, it is occurring among Americans at all ages. The same trends are seen among whites, blacks, and Latinos among both college graduates and adults with only a high school education, and among women as well as men. Between 2007 and 2014, the Christian share of the population fell from 78.4% to 60.70.6. And over that same period, the percentage of Americans who were religiously unaffiliated, describing themselves as atheist, agnostic, or nothing in particular, has jumped more than six points from 16.1% to 22.8 percent. In the East Ohio Conference, we're working hard to increase the vitality of our congregations, and yet our 2014 local church reports indicate that we have some trends that are similar to the national ones. Even as United Methodists in other parts of the world are growing, Six, 362 of our churches had at least one profession of faith last year, and 300 and 86, more than 50%, did not have one profession of faith. I hate to say this dissonance, but as your bishop, when I think of the resources we're using to support our churches, keeping buildings open and salaries, and over half of our churches did not have one new disciple professing their faith. It makes me want to get down on my knees and have a prayer service to repent because we're in this together. We can't say, well, that church. In no, we're in this together. All of our churches were started by this conference. And they were all under the care of this conference. There's an arrangement between my appointment of a pastor and this conference with your local church. So it's not just, you can't say, well, that church. In no, together we should get down and repent that we've not been able to do something. 
Can you feel the tension? Can you feel the dissonance? Well, how is God calling us up and where is their encouragement? Well, I was scurrying around. How do we find encouragement in this area? And what I discovered is I found joy in a place I never expected it. Let me tell you a story that brought me hope. First of all, do you remember the strategic pyramid that I shared about focusing on our ministries? I think we have a chart of that. Well, in that pyramid, we said if we would align our resources and develop leaders, we can inspire growth in vital congregations. That's true. But then I looked at the section where it says clergy and laity on the pyramid. They're of equal size. The largest part of our leadership, however, is lay leaders. So I'm saying, wait a minute. But most of our leaders are lay, and the role of clergy from Ephesians 4 is to equip the saints for the work of ministry. So we might want to redesign that, but there's far more laity. They're the bulk of our ministry. And yet when I ask lay members about their ministry, invariably they often tell me about some church program they're in, even their mission work or advocacy is through a church program. And what I encourage me most is when I find a church member who's organizing a Bible study or a support group or doing something with people at work, not necessarily religious things, but there's some sort of accountable, there's some sort of a coming alongside people at work. That's what excites me. So I got this crazy notion that we need to start helping young people do ministries outside the church like John and Charles Wesley went outside the church. So I talked to our lay leader, Greg Wrench, and I said, why don't we have each of our district uh, lay leaders come up with like 10 young people that we can help train to do accountable groups outside the church and so what looked easy on paper became very difficult we tried it and we spent about maybe six months or so we couldn't find many people that were interested we couldn't explain exactly what we wanted we all became a little frustrated you might say the music was not playing like we wanted it to then several morning months later i woke up one day with a holy spirit moment I was inspired by the notion that, John, maybe we don't need to find people and train them for it. Maybe God is already ahead of us. Maybe we don't need another program. Maybe we already have young followers of Jesus who are outside the church already self-organizing, kind of like John and Charles Wesley already. So last fall, I met with five groups of young adults between 18 and 40 years of age. And I had five meetings with people that wondered why a bishop wanted to talk to them. I had took me a little song and dance to convince them we weren't going to sign them up for anything or ask for money. <laughs> if any of you are here that with those, I just want to thank you, whether you were clergy or lay. Those were powerful meetings for me. They gave me hope, folks. So I asked them two questions. One of them is, how, do you start how did you start following Jesus Christ? And the second question, how are you living and growing as a disciple today? And I was really using them kind of as a focus group. And I've got to tell you, when they met around those tables, they had no trouble talking about Jesus. Every one of those young people could say why they started following Jesus. Now, when I say young people, there was one pediatrician, about three nurses. There was two entrepreneurs that had started their own business. There was a funeral home director who had had a, uh, uh, a Master of Divinity degree. These young people were young professional people, and they had no trouble talking about Jesus. And then when we ask them, well, how are you living and growing as a disciple today? I was blown away. They are already self working Now, not everybody was, but many of them were starting their own groups. Many of them were going to a Methodist church for worship, but they were going to another church for some fellowship or mission work. That they were getting their spiritual act together, and they were meeting with other friends their age. There was one church of a, of a couple that was there. They were under 40, but they had two kids, and the church that they were part of did not have anything for their age group. And I thought they were going to tell me a story about how they left that church and went to another church. But no. What they said, we just said we we're going to do it ourselves. So at home, we started inviting about four other couples. And now, once out every other week or something, our families get together for prayer and for a meal together so that we can hold each other accountable in our faith and how we're parents. Just out of nothing. You see, I believe God is raising up disciples who re will reclaim the ministry of the laity outside of the programs of the church without kicking the program of the church under the bus. Where most of us... We've been trained to come into the programs of the church and have not taken the responsibility for doing work outside. And I have been encouraged. And what I learned is that young people are more interested in actions than words, that personal faith develops through relationships, and that people need a safe place to talk about their spiritual journey. And it's not just the young people that are self-organizing for faith, sharing, support, and prayer. I believe Jesus is calling missionaries for the next generation 
And maybe God is calling you to have your ministry of your baptism outside the church, organizing people for doing the works of Christ. I am encouraged when God leads individuals to improvise and take responsibility for their own faith development when they move beyond their comfort zone and do something for God. Now, I've got a few resources here I'm going to flash up real quick. One of them is from Kevin Watson, who's at Candler, who's written a book about uh, uh, the Methodist uh, class meeting. Another one is The New Adapters, written by uh, Jacob Armstrong with Adam Hamilton and Mike Slaughter. Uh, it's a, a book about how you can uh, get your church outside the walls. And the third one is one uh, written by Dr. Jim Osier that he wrote with Kiana Hayworth. And Jim Osier is going to be with us tomorrow. The book's called Clip In. And uh, he talks about risking hospitality in your church. But not only does this book give you practical advice about hospitality, it helps us be hospitably hospitable in our daily living and perhaps most importantly in this book he trains people of how not to be consumers of ministry when they come into your church but how to be producers of ministry so I would highly recommend that we're looking forward to hearing Jim tomorrow and finally I want you to realize I want you to realize how important your ministry is because when you were baptized and brought into the church and every time you come back and have holy communion and continue that relationship with the church you are changing the world I want you to see this clip about how one pastor explained what he does for the church people often say to me they say J. John you know what what do you do and it's always very difficult to know what to say because if I say to you that I'm a reverend, which I am, that conjures up certain images in people's minds as to what I might be. So I like to be a little bit creative in telling people what I do. I sat next to this lady on an aeroplane at Heathrow Airport and I said, hello. And she said, well, hello. And I said, where are you going? And she says, I'm going to Singapore. Then she said to me, where are you going? I said, I'm going to Australia. I said, what do you do? So she told me. Then she said, what do you do? And I said, well, <laughs> I work for a global enterprise. She said, do you? I said, yes, I do. I said, we've got outlets in nearly every country of the world. She said, have you? I said, yes, we have. I said, we've got hospitals and hospices and homeless shelters. I said, we do marriage work. We've got orphanages. We've got feeding programs, educational programs. I said, we do all sorts of justice and reconciliation things. I said, basically, we look after people from birth to death and we deal in the area of behavioral alteration. She went, wow! And it was so loud, her wow, loads of people turned around and looked at us. She says, what's it called? I said, it's called the church. Isn't it? If we are a follower of Jesus, wow. then we are part of a global Absolutely. enterprise. But not only is it global, it's intergalactic because it includes everyone that's gone before us. Wow. <laughs> People of <laughs> What you do is very important. So when people ask you, what do you do, what do you tell them? Do you tell them that we work for a global enterprise with outlets in nearly every country of the world? Do you tell them that we got hospitals, hospices, homeless shelters, that we do marriage work, that we've got orphanages and feeding programs and educational programs, that we do all sorts of justice and reconciliation things and we take care of people basically from birth to death? Is that what you tell them? And that we deal in, well, deal in the area of behavioral alteration? And it starts with us? <laughs> the behavioral alteration starts with us. That's what's unique about our company. Just look around you right now. Look at these saints around you and look at their capacity to carry the work of Christ outside the church into the relationships that they have in the community. 
to start three or four people coming together to have a prayer meeting or to just check in. I keep thinking of an oncology nurse that got three or four people just to gather 20 minutes before a shift because it's hard in oncology and just checking in. And they're not all Christian, but they come and they pray together because it's not easy and they're impressed that there are Christians in the group who know that there's a source stronger than themselves. Can't you do those kind of ministries? Individually and collectively, you are a gift from God. You are the church, the body of Christ for the salvation of the world. Sisters and brothers in Christ, be encouraged and encourage one another. For I believe Jesus is calling us up to serve him in these wonderful and difficult times. I believe that he's going to help us deal with that dissonance of disparity and find resolution. I believe he's going to deal in an amazing way with the dissonance of diversity. And with that dissonance of discipleship, we're starting today to change that and to find home again. God will not forsake us, and our Lord Jesus is solid. We can trust him. We can trust him. Will you sing with me? Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus and to take him at his word, just to rest upon his promise and to know, thus saith the Lord, Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him, how I loved him trust him I think that's it. Thank you, my friends. There you go, Dan. Go forth in this day. Make do with what you have. Just improvise. If you've got any disturbances or dissonance, whine with a friend and then have the hope that home is out there and you can make it home again. We'll see you this afternoon after a great dinner. Thank you very much.